Hi, every Hi everyone. I'm Emily. And I'm Suzanne. Good morning. Um, and we're very thankful to be here today to talk to you all. Um, we're hoping we can give you some new tools or resources that will help you navigate our very complex healthcare system and hopefully in doing so mitigate some of the stress you carry with you um, in your diagnosis. So we are talking from the inside of the medical system and trying to help you when you come into the inside to navigate as we go. We have listed multidisciplinary teams. So you may know this is our experience uh, in Boston, but in centers, other centers are different and have may have different um, compositions of teams. But our take is that uh, you are not alone and we want you to know who the members of your team are in their functions so that you know who you need to speak with when you have an issue. Um, so we are, the team is here for you. They are, as you can tell, there's many parts of the team. It's a collaborative team. They're doing research. They're going to conferences. This is their life as well. So they're here to help you and while we want you to question them and to come with your preparation and your research, we just want you to know that we're all in the same boat here. Um, so key players you can um, expect to be part of your multidisciplinary team is a dermatologist, a medical oncologist, hematologist, um, a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant who supports the dermatologist or medical oncologist. Um, there should be nursing staff at uh, Dana-Farber. We're referred to as oncology nurse navigators, um, but that might look a little different depending where you are. Um, they've been nursing support has been referred to as program nurses, um, or maybe there's an LPN or RN that supports the physician in that office. Um, you might also meet with a radiation oncologist. This is depending on your disease state, um, a transplant team. Uh, social work is also an important part of the care team um, and can provide some extra assistance and support, um, a pharmacist, and of course you and your caregiver. Um, oftentimes we see patients who are diagnosed in the community um, and then come to us for second opinion or expert opinion. Um, so it's also very important that we loop back in your primary care team um, as well as your local dermatologist, any specialty physicians you might see locally to let them know your treatment plan um, and what is going on. And to play off that, so as we noted, your PCP might also need to be that person who is sending in referrals. So a lot of times we, if you're seen at a center and they need to be referred out for local treatment or for follow-up, maybe not in Boston or another major city, your PCP needs to be involved to be able to help navigate that aspect. It can be challenging. And uh, we try, you know, with our electronic medical system, we try to keep people CC'd on all the notes to keep people up to date, but they're busy as well. So sometimes it's helpful to have the patients as well calling and saying, hey, FYI, I just had, I went to this place, there's an update on my notes. So at least a nurse or someone else in the office of your local physician can alert them that your condition is changing and you might need some help. And also when you're meeting with these physicians, it's good to ask how they communicate with each other because if it's just one doctor to doctor to doctor and there's no communication, that's not going to result in your best care. So we want to ask them, how are you going to communicate this with my radiation oncologist or how is that surgeon going to communicate back with your primary care team as well? And uh, as Emily alluded to, we have a lot of social workers at our institution who are wonderful. We also have resource specialists. So in Boston, if you're coming from far away to ask, hey, are there people here that can help with housing? Or, you know, I get coming here for rides is a challenge. Is there anyone here that can help me learn how to get here? And uh, without having to drive 93 at seven in the morning for three hours, you know, how do I navigate this? Um, so next, we're going to talk about how to prepare for your visit. If you're seeking second opinion or expert opinion at a larger institution, um, we recommend that you come prepared with lots of questions, but having these written down, um, either on a pen and paper, uh, iPad, um, your, even on your phone. Um, but just have these outlined because uh, your visit can be very overwhelming. Um, maybe your treatment plan changed or just a lot of information all at once. So you want to make sure you have those jotted down um, so you leave with your questions answered. Um, some questions you might want to ask your physician are, what is my disease state? 
Um, what is my treatment plan? What medications am I going to start today? Um, and what are these medications? What are the expected side effects or when may I see an improvement with this medication? Um, so those are some important things to jot down. We want to stress that no topic is too embarrassing or image. Um, so we, we recommend full disclosure with your physicians, whether it's the medications you're taking. Um, it might be some alternative um, remedies that you're trying. Um, full disclosure is encouraged. And on that note, if, you, if you're being told of a certain treatment approach, for example, a lot of people don't like the ointments and they'll, they'll tell us after, you know, I didn't actually use them. So we would prefer to know that up front because that gives your provider and team an idea of, okay, so ointments aren't going to be the best route. What is plan B? It's better to be honest and then, then lose time down the road and have to try and backtrack and control down the road. Um, we talked about the side effects of the medication, how long, how until you, long until you see a benefit, but also another aspect is the cost. Uh, over the past probably five or six years, many of you probably noticed that the out-of-pocket outlay for topical steroids has gone through the roof depending on your plan. And it's something to bring up and say, hey, if you want me to do the pulse therapy with steroids, if the clobetazole is not covered, what is a, a secondary medication? Just so that you're prepared down the road to know that we don't we want to give you the best care, but unfortunately there's times when it's some what we would like is just not affordable. And we want to be able to plan that ahead. Um, and we have on this slide, avoid Dr. Google. Um, <laughs> although the internet is wonderful, there's also a lot of scary information out there. Um, and misinformation just can add to some of your stress and anxiety. Um, but we encourage you to look to sites like the CLF Foundation um, for some good facts um, and um, reliable uh, as a reliable source. I have to add, and I don't remember if we covered this, but if you're coming to a major center, whether or not it's Yale or Boston or, or Penn, to ask if you're not living within an hour of the facility or so, is it possible once I start, can I get this treatment closer to home? Because for us, they, we have satellites where if it's possible and someone mentions it, we try to get them closer to home so they're not driving in because it affects your quality of life having to spend that much time in and out. So it can't hurt to ask. That's basically the take home for all of this is full disclosure and you might as well ask and all I can say is no or not at this time, but it's worth putting it out there. So a major part of our role as oncology nurse navigators is helping you manage and monitor your symptoms at home. Um, but at different institutions, um, you might not have an oncology nurse navigator. So our recommendation is to ask your provider, who is my point of contact? Who is my direct line person I should go to if I have symptoms at home or concerns I want to run by someone? Uh, finding out that point of contact's hours, days they work, um, and a good route to communicate with them, whether that be a phone number, email. Um, a lot of hospitals have an electronic medical record, um, so use, using the patient portal to send them a message um, to run by your symptoms, um, but finding out who that person might be. Um, and then proactive reporting. Uh, we want you telling us, you know, a little anything really. Um, we rather let you let us know than keeping us in the dark um, and then having things get real bad at home. Um, we found the use of photography very helpful um, and we ask and encourage our patients to send photos if they have a concerning area, something that's not improving. Um, and we also ask that patients uh, keep a log at home. Uh, maybe take a photo a week or a photo every few days at an area to um, track its, the treatment of that area. If it's getting better, um, if it's getting worse, a picture um, can tell us a lot. And I don't think you mentioned this, but to also ask who you send those photos to, because if you have the photos, we have an electronic medical record where you can send it through. Um, I know I have problems figuring out how you do that. So if it's easier to get an email address or contact for our administrative assistant as well, for us at least, it's a nice way or easier way. However, we can facilitate it for you. That's how we want it to happen. Um, we also want you to share with us 
in the team as well. Historically, if you're new to us, you've been treated in the community. How have things worked for you in the past? So we're able to plan or what things haven't worked as well and looking at your skin and what you've tried and, and what going forward may or may not be beneficial and to keep an eye on, as we she noted before, um, the possibilities of infection. And, and that's why we like the photos and a photo really is worth a thousand words in terms of our ability to figure out what's going on. If you um, provide your consent for care everywhere, we are able to see lab work scans, typically not photos. Um, and it's, it's also a little hard to navigate sometimes, but we can see some of the, the office notes in there. Um, photos are something I've, I've never seen come through. Pet scans, those reports come through. Um, sometimes not the images. Yeah. I don't believe the image does, but the report will from the radiologist. So EPIC is an electronic medical record. Um, it's one of the more commonly used systems. Um, however, um, even in Boston itself, I know there's other institutions that use different systems, and uh, we rely on those places to send us faxes of records, outside records. A lot of institutions do say UMass has Epic or so, but in Leahy has the whole system, but it's a matter of at least, a, so I go to my primary care and they can see everything I've had done at Partners, which is odd because when you're at Partners or Dana-Farber, you ha which is a good thing, but there's a, a firewall and you have to sign consent saying, yes, I, can, I will let someone else see what's happening here at Dana-Farber. So there's a lot of, of, of consenting as you go. So if it's something where you know you're, managed or your care is managed at a few institutions to make sure that you sign consent and let everyone share that information if that's something you are, would like to do. Yes. When it comes to EPIC, EPIC is, oh, this doesn't work. Oh, it's it's okay. Well, as regards to EPIC, EPIC is now it works is a wonderful uh, system and everything is linked together. Uh, I've had surgery in California and my doctor can see everything except the scans and the x-rays. Um, I see Dr. Foss in Connecticut. I get treated in Massachusetts at uh, Mass General and Dana-Farber and, and all over and they can just go into patient anywhere and if a doctor wants to leave a note, they can make notes for other doctors. It's a it's a wonderful thing. I think the federal government requires that all hospitals or doctors have to be able to communicate somehow by, I don't know what the, the date is, but I, it's, it's um, so EPIC is, is definitely the way to go. And if your hospital has it, you should just authorize it. Thanks, Richard. And I would say that is improving. I think it, I think there's a, a ways to come, but I think we're on the right track to linking everything together. Um, we also recommend keeping a journal, um, either on a computer or a pen and paper, and tracking uh, day by day the treatments you're using, the medications you're taking, um, what your itch is that day, rate, rating that on a scale of 0 to 10. Um, also, it, reporting any other symptoms, if you're fatigued, if you have any pain, any other um, systemic symptoms, which just means head to toe, um, how you're feeling, um, as well as reporting any signs of infection. Of course, you can keep these in the journal, but that's the point where we want you to contact that point of contact in the office to let them know um, you have a concerning area. Uh, things to look out for would be an area on the skin that has drainage, that is red and inflamed, that is warm to the touch, maybe has some odor, and of course, if you're having a fever.
All right. So next step after you've gone into your major medical institution and you've been given a treatment plan, a lot of times people would prefer to be treated closer to home as we discussed. And we would say, okay, so we're going to refer you close to home to any one of these possible treatment plans. So we just want to give you our side and the nitty gritty so we're on the same page. So for phototherapy, which is the narrow band and the UVA therapy, which is standing in the, the light booth about three times a week. Uh, I know there are five or six centers in Boston, and then it starts to dissipate as you go west and north and south. And so we might not see them quite as frequently. There have also been changes in coverage. So before where years ago we used to send people and they were covered and they would just go. Now there's frequently a $50 copay per visit, which is three dimes a week, and that can get very expensive. Um, then there are also the home units, which we also advocate if it's uh, appropriate for folks, but those also have a very expensive outlay and there have been recent changes as well where seemingly the only diagnosis that's covered for a home unit officially is psoriasis. So it's a bit of an uphill climb and we want you to know that we are here and fighting it with you. And so it's a back and forth in communication of what you're willing to do and what is possible for your band and UVA. We also, uh, for radiation, or actually maybe I'll skip down to photophoresis, and that is our ECP, which is also uh, at a ma usually a major institution, and that is sort of the phototherapy of the, the blood, in that there's one site in Maine that does that, and there's a, a few in Boston, and then it starts again to one in Rhode Island, and, and yep, and there's a, a handouts out front. Um, none in, there was one at Yale. So it starts to, again, that your centers start to dissipate close to home. And again, that's usually twice a week, every three to four weeks. Okay. Yeah. I'm showing this. Um, so twice, uh, about twice a week, every, yes. Yeah, so if anyone likes some information more specific on the treatment plan or how the... Oh, the centers, yeah, yeah. There's, um, but again, in New England area, there's, you know, we usually outside of Boston, there's kind of one or two per state. So it becomes a, a travel issue and also referral and can you make it there and, and twice a week, every two to three weeks, how do we manage that as well? Um, on this list are also um, a local laboratory, so we're not going to drag our patients in um, once a week or every two weeks to have their labs checked. We're going to ask that you find a lab close to home that you can go in and have your labs drawn. Um, we'll send those over, um, and then they'll be faxed over so we can take a look at your labs that are monitoring you while on treatment. Um, we also commonly transition your treatments. If, um, if the providers decide it's time and okay, we can um, collaborate with local medical oncologists to transfer that treatment close to home. Um, this is easier with FDA-approved drugs for, um, for the disease, um, but that is also possible just to make life a little easier and your um, commute not as long. Um, also on this list are wound care centers. Um, we do collaborate with wound care specialists when we need creative ways to cover some open areas with special dressings. Um, Suzanne and I have gotten pretty creative in the last few years, uh, finding new, um, some new technology, new dressings that will keep you infection free um, and treating open areas. And we've learned a lot as well from caregivers and patients themselves when you are able to be out there and seeing people and, and addressing your needs depending on the kind of dressings you need or so. And we've learned a lot. So please feel free to come and say, hey, this is something new that I've learned because we're not seeing the front lines of wound care every day, but it's great to know what's out there and all the different alternatives because it only benefits other patients down the road. One thing uh, area I didn't touch on is radiation. So if you, you can receive radiation at a major medical center or closer to home, if it's more standard radiation, brachytherapy, which is localized radiation on a curved area that can't uh, be treated by external beam, is mostly in, again, Boston or, or in Massachusetts, also at a center on the South Shore. But 
in total skin is at Leahy and Yale. So again, these are facilities where when a physician says, I'd like you to receive this, or provider says, I'd like you to receive this, then we're saying, okay, but how far away is it? And what is the plan where total skin might be every day for three weeks or four days a week? Oh, in, at Dartmouth, in Dartmouth. Oh, great, great. So it's at Dartmouth and um, in Boston and Leahy. But it's a challenge. Uh, also, it's just to be able to know that you would have to go further perhaps than you had planned and to ask, where do I go and how do I stay there? I know at Leahy, at least if you talk to the social workers there, they do have a lot of discounts, but there's no free housing. So it's a, one more thing to think about. Um, we generally like just to review uh, good skin and wound care. Um, we, to fight infection and prevent infection, we encourage our patients uh, to wash with mild, fragrant free soaps, wash, or cleansers, and as well as moisturize with fragrance free fragrance-free products, uh, to take lukewarm showers, not hot showers that would dry out your skin, make you itch or make your skin angry. Um, as directed by your MD, sometimes we can, um, direct the patients to do bleach baths to decrease your bacterial load on the skin. Of course, optimal nutrition and hydration are important in factors in preventing infection. And if you're having difficulty with nutrition, that is something to voice to your practitioner. Let them know because they can hook you up with a nutritionist at the institute um, or even a nurse who might be able to find you nutritional services closer to home. Um, and if needed, uh, again, we will refer to a wound care center for consultation. And in terms of protecting your skin, so initially I worked in melanoma and I came to cutaneous T-cell lymphoma and they said, no, no, we put people in lights and then the sun. And I said, that's, no, no, we don't do that. So it's, uh, this is a good point to ask questions because if you're receiving narrow band in the past or phototherapy and they put you under UV light and then you perhaps you're on Valclor and the plan changes and we say, no, no, no. Do not expose that area to light. So asking questions along the way and never assume is a good step for us. And we've learned this along the way as well, that to ask questions as we go, because there are some things which are prohibited and not, and do you sun protect and do you not sun protect? And especially with UVA light, that you want to protect everything, your eyes, all your skin, so as you, uh, especially in the days of treatment or while you're under treatment. So it's a matter of as we keep enforcing discontinual uh, communication back and forth. An important part of taking care of the whole individual is also um, paying attention to your social and emotional concerns and needs. Um, in order for us to do our job, we, we'd like you to discuss and um, discuss your fears, uh, discuss your emotional concerns with your provider in order for us to hook you up with the right folks. Um, some people prefer a more one-on-one -on -one approach. Um, and in those instances, we can set you up with a social worker, uh, maybe a psychiatrist, therapy, um, someone who will meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, other, other patients prefer a more of a group setting um, and networking events, which we can also, um, you know, hook you up with. Um, <laughs> so I went on uh, in preparation some of the Facebook pages for cutaneous lymphoma, and I have to say, some of the photos there, I was found a little disconcerting because there's a lot of questions and there's not a lot of answers. And my take home from that is if you're finding that or if you have a an area of concern where you want to submit it to a photo, I want you to call your doctor or your team or your nurse and say, I need you to look at an area. Because if you start, I personally started to panic a little bit. So if you start to have an area of concern to share it and not, and it's great to share it with your peers as well. And people are in the same boat, but if it's something where you want an answer to go back to your team and you're, they're going to get you an answer, whether it's the answer you want, or if it's coming for a biopsy and let's look at it, that's probably the best route to take. So it mitigates your anxiety perhaps, and it's not going to reduce it to nothing, but it might reduce it to a point where it's more manageable. And that's our goal is to make, life was just a little bit easier for especially community supports or one-to-one -one if transplant is something in the uh, 
in, in potentially down the road for you that they, I know they have one-to-one at major medical centers usually about, do you want to talk to someone who's undergone what you've undergone and to get some questions out that we might not know the answer to initially. Um, in terms of support, the CLF website, as you know, when you're here, it is amazing and that's a great source to go to. We have some other websites at the end for resources as well and people to talk to. Um, and then we'll talk about, well, I'll let Emily talk about the makeup aspect and sort of the social aspect of how to manage some fears and anxiety. Um, some patients have vocalized to us their fear of um, going out in the public, maybe for a special life event um, when their disease uniquely is visible on their skin. Um, and when their voice, when they're voicing this concern, there are um, available resources. We can, um, there's Dermablend, uh, which is a makeup that um, can cover almost everything. They have a YouTube video um, that covers up, you know, sleeves of tattoos that we have uh, recommended that patients use. Um, I also just briefly wanted to touch on alternative therapies. Um, at Dana-Farber, we have a Zacum Center um, that provides meditation, acupuncture, acupressure, Reiki, uh, massage, yoga, uh, a combination of therapies that some patients find useful. Um, maybe not necessarily will be covered by insurance, but it might be something that really helps you um, get through and manage your symptoms. Um, so I would encourage you to investigate their availability at home if you're interested. And some folks, uh, if we mentioned social work in a visit, some people might take it perhaps the wrong way or so. So a lot of times social work isn't initially offered as a, hey, do you want to meet with a social worker today at this first time we've met you? And someone might think, why do you want me to meet with a social worker? But if it's something where you think it would be helpful for you, we want you to voice your concern because if you come to us and we're thinking we're going to try and mitigate your symptoms and make a plan of care, but if that's something you're thinking, yeah, I'd really like to be able to talk to someone and we have these supports, so we want you to say, I really would like to meet with someone in nutrition and social work and we can get the ball rolling, but just to express your wishes. Oh, the fun part. Um, so I feel like insurance changes daily and what coverage is changes daily. And currently the Affordable Care Act is still in place, which is covers 20 million people and it's good because it allows people to have insurance without with pre-existing conditions. It There's a, a rider in there that if you have been denied by your insurance company, you're allowed to go to an outside third party to have it reviewed. And often uh, what they say about 50% of the time, a, a claim is turned overturned if to go to an outside third party who's neutral and can look at it. So there's a lot of aspects to this where it's changing and we try to keep up, but it's hard. And there's so many different policies and nuances to everyone's individual policy that um, unless it's Medicare and, and then there's the secondary coverage and trying to figure that out. So in terms for us, if you are educated as to what your plan or have at least your ID card with you and so we can try and track down what your insurance coverage is, that's helpful for us to try and figure that out. Um, the unfortunate side effect of, of what we're doing now is the expense. So we have all kinds of great medication, but they're getting more expensive and we're trying to figure out how to navigate expense and be able to treat people efficaciously. There's a cost of medications that we're talk about as well. Um, if, like we said earlier, if we prescribe something and it's just not affordable, we want to know about it. We don't want you to try and split pills or skip days or, or go bankrupt. That's not, creating financial toxicity is not our intent. So, and it's not your intent of the providers. They just, they're not thinking of the medication's cost, which is a good thing because we don't want them to try and steer your care toward uh, the financial aspect, but it's also something where we need to think about in the big picture. 
Um, GoodRx is a great website that has coupon codes. I would encourage you to check that out when you're prescribed a new medication. And it is, um, they provide coupon codes for all different pharmacies, something you can print out um, and bring with you when you're picking up your medication. Um, like Suzanne said, if you get there and the coupon still doesn't bring the cost down um, to a reasonable amount, that's something definitely to communicate to your care team. Um, sometimes, we actually encourage patients to pick up their medication without using their insurance. Um, sometimes it's cheaper. Um, so that's also another thing to look into when you're at the pharmacy. And the pharmacist should be able to help you when you're there. One aspect that a lot of people don't, don't see is the fact that there are two things. They're on Medicare, Medicaid, or government-applied programs. Totally different than if you're on a commercial or an employer base. Uh, plan because if it's a commercial uh, employer based plan, then certain things like um, high deductible plans have a maximum out of pocket of $6,500 a year. So even if you spend $150,000 like I do, I hit $6,500 and I don't need to go to the rest of the year. The other thing is if you're on a commercial employer plan, Massachusetts has a the um, chemotherapy charity act, which says that certain drugs, and Cartretin is one of them, is covered as if you were getting an infusion at the hospital. So, in a lot of states, other states have that one also. And, but if you're on Medicare, Medicaid is pretty much not in that group. And if you're on a private pay plan, you are. That differentiation is something that we really, we really should be discussing with people because it doesn't apply to me. Like for instance, ECP photophoresis is FDA uh, approved for CTCL. So no prior approval is required in Massachusetts under Blue Cross Blue Shield policy for ECP. Whereas if you're on Medicaid, Medicare, I don't know. And even there, I think, uh, the government pays for photophoresis that they might not pay for Tigretin or make you take Bexaritine or it, it's not just a matter of private pay or government plans. It's the two are totally different as far as how they're applied. Right, right. And, and we've had a situation where uh, someone's insurance covered ECP, but there were extra fees, as you might notice on bills now, there's site fees and hospital fees. There's all these fees that all of a sudden added up to a couple extra hundred dollars per treatment as well. So there's all these sort of extra uh, hurdles you have to get through, even if it's seemingly covered and to keep your eyes open and just keep an eye on the bills as well as they come through. So initially you might think, oh, it's great, it's covered, but then we find out down the road that there's extra costs to it. So um, I found, and you've probably already been there and found this too, but on the cancer insurance checklist, because we have people who often say to us, well, I'm going to switch plans and how do I know? And there is this amazing checklist, which basically will walk you through of what you need because it says, what, what have I had in the past? What do I need for medications? What is covered? What is not? And every year, the formulary can change frequently. We look through just five years of a, a Medicare formulary, and, and uh, there are significant changes in all coverage uh, from schedules. So it's something to just to walk you through, and it's a very easy-to-use system. Um, I, I, any, any addition, anything additional that'll help me, I'll take. Um, we talk about, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, down, look down below here. We talk about also in terms of quality of life, in terms of taking time off. So your social and emotional concerns of taking time off to go to work and financially, how will that affect you if you're taking time off to not be a caregiver, taking time off to go to your visits to, you might need weeks at a time. And how do we do that? We want you to ask us if you need an FMLA form signed or any insurance forms or talk to your employer if that is something that's applicable. How do we manage that and get you the time off that you need without having to have that extra worry? 
Um, some of the drug companies also have patient assistance programs, um, so we utilize those as well. Just thought I'd mention that last bit. Um, and we're going to switch to our last slide. Does anyone have questions? No? Okay. This is Suzanne's slide. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. So I am a big fan of speaking up because as we've worked in this area for a while now, it, we can notice the changes where uh, coverage isn't what it used to be or certain things are covered now and, and they weren't before or vice versa and how come? And usually it's because people get their voices heard, whether or not it's a lobbying group or, or I won't even go down that road. Um, but we want you to to speak up, you're here and you're learning and, and the CLF Foundation is fantastic and they advocate for you on a, a federal level, but at a local level too, there's all sort of, there's there's tiny things that affect people such as, um, someone was talking recently about the proposals of, of Medicare for All expansion and however people think of that, then you have to educate people about what if those people with disabilities and the car votes and there's tiny minutia which someone across the board, someone thinking globally isn't going to think of small details such as carve outs or narrow band or phototherapy and in home units and without the voices of people who are directly affected by changes in policy, changes happen without their consideration. So we want you to get out there and to advocate. I put up here um, tweet as well. I don't tweet, but there are a lot of people that do and to be able and and like staffers for people who are elected representatives read the tweets. So if you're able to get into their feed and to get your voice out and your your thoughts and how thing how changes affect you and policies affect you as well and your caregivers. So sometimes you're exhausted and your caregivers can advocate for you and vice versa. And it's advocate for with your providers or whomever in the community. And maybe you need more handicap parking around you, whatever. As long as you're speaking up and getting your voice heard, um, you know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. We have on the last slide, which we'll show, is a lot of links and uh, for other sites and groups. One of them is the Mass State Insurance Commission. So if you feel that your insurance coverage, it's not going to be Medicare because, you know, they don't call you back. Um, but if your insurance should have covered something and they're not, and you're getting the runaround to call the Mass State Insurance Commission, and yeah, sometimes it feels like you're talking to a black hole, but you have to start somewhere and you can register a complaint and they are supposed to listen. And that's going to, you know, it has to start somewhere. Um, let's see, what else do we want to say here? We can flip that slide. Oh, you already did. Okay, great. So it's kind of also a podcast too. I love listening to podcasts. So if um, you get out there and there's someone you want to talk to or CLF or some of the uh, insurance uh, policy and healthcare policy in the podcast as well. So we have a lot of websites, the Triage Cancer, which is fantastic. And I'm sure a lot of you have been there. And that is a, a deep dive, but it's about a lot of the, the legal aspects and the insurance aspects, and there's synopses on here about the ADA, and there's, unfortunately, it's all sorts of things that you have to consider taking time off or, or someone with cancer and your disease and how you're covered while you're receiving your care and how you're protected. Uh, it's clearly the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, NCCN guidelines, it's always good to know. Sometimes if people will say, oh, well, it's not covered by NCCN, you can say, well, it is. It is because I know that. Um, for if you're having a, a bad window, there's a website and a group called Cleaning for a Reason. And I checked it out and there's actually some folks in Massachusetts where cleaning companies, if you register, they will come out, I don't know how often, but will help you out and clean your house for you, which is sometimes a big burden to relieve. Uh, and you can also, if you're a caregiver, if you know someone, you can also give the gift of house cleaning and you can give a donation and they'll go and, and clean someone's house. And that is amazing. Um, we have your the Mass Division of Insurance, which is also where you would go to complain. Um, Common Cause USA, Mass Legislative, where you would find your federal and state elected officials to go and voice your concerns. Um, let's see, Mass Government, all, all kinds of stuff here. Um, healthcare.gov, just so you know of all your ACA protections currently, if you are privately insured. Um, if you need more 
assistance in picking out a plan. They, in Massachusetts, they have the, the SHINE programs where at local uh, elder centers or uh, even around town, and there's that website there, you can find one, but they will go and they will meet with you and they will look at all your plan options. Uh, even if you have a Medicare coverage and have Medicare uh, supplements to be able to look and, and guide you you have to come educated as to what your needs are and what your outlays would be, and they can help you make a choice that's good for you. Uh, cancerfinances.org as well. So we talked about before, we don't want you to have to suffer financial toxicity, and these folks will help you plan as much as possible, as much as planning as possible, to be able to take time off, or if you can't take time off, how do, how do you make that happen and still receive your treatment? And it just gives you more information and education how to that will work. And as I talked to before, the cancerinsurancechecklist.org, which itself is its own site, to be able to walk through and be able to make a uh, educated decision as to what the best plan is for you at this point. And there's tons more. Tons, ton, tons more. So feel free to share. This is just tip of the iceberg. I guess we could open it up for questions. We have time. a little bit behind, but we can do that. Oh, okay. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. I think this is all really great because these are all the things outside of the treatment that we need. Marianne, um, are you allowed to ask questions? You're a speaker. Uh, no. Uh, one, I wanted to make a plug. You guys had mentioned uh, journaling and just a lot of the companies that are here today that are helping us with our program um, have... Uh, apps and different journal um, modalities so that you can track your disease. Because one thing I know I came in, I think I'd taken a walk down the hall. We were talking about the electronic medical record and how wonderful that is. It is wonderful in some sense, but certain things kind of get lost in translation or copied forward in translation. And I think that for patients, if they, if they utilize journaling or apps or whatever, pen, I have a patient who loves her, her notebook and pen and it works beautifully. But keeping track of what happens over time, because when you were talking about adding new therapies, there may be something that we've taken along with us for many years and it gets lost, that maybe they, the patient was using Valclor, but we've introduced a new therapy, and maybe Valclor, which is nitrogen mustard, doesn't make sense anymore. And during that 10 or 15 minutes that you're with a clinician, that may not, that discussion may not happen. But if you journal and you keep track of your treatment over time, you take better care of yourself. So that was one comment. And then the other was the role of palliative care. Where do you see palliative care in um, managing symptoms in this disease? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest that um, palliative care is brought in as soon as possible. And because for these days, we see palliative care more as a, a social or referral service, a social worker. So, so if you are, have intractable itch and we've tried a lot of avenues, you know, someone in palliative care may have tried something that we didn't even think of, which is hard to, hard to imagine, but uh, also with pain, pain or neuropathy or so many, or depending on treatment, some nausea, vomiting, anything that we are trying to mitigate and you don't think that we're, maybe we're not doing the best job that we would bring in palliative care because their job is to, it's not hospice, it's palliation. It's to try and remedy and make things better and make you feel better and optimize your quality of life. So if someone, if a provider mentions, you know, maybe we'll consult you know, palliative care. It's not, it's not a punitive thing. It's not a bad thing. We just want to get their opinion and to learn what they're doing. Great. 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 And we'll have all these slides as well. So you've got all of the resources. Um, and a lot of these are listed on our website as well. And I'm really glad that you brought up the, um, the state insurance, because if you do get denied, that's a really good avenue. I learned that this year, actually, for all and every state's a little bit different. But if you run into trouble, that's a really good, a really good place to um, to submit a complaint for coverage, and I was told that the the percentages are something like sixty to seventy percent of insurance denials get overturned at the state level. So it's a pain, but a good thing. Yeah, Richard. In Massachusetts, there's an issue with that because if you go to the state and the state denies you, you can't go to court. Okay, well, good to know. Good to know. Yeah, and every state's a little bit different, but can't answer all of that. Trying to, yeah. Right. 
it doesn't right close the, close the door on you yeah yeah so you got to know your state's laws that's always an interesting challenge but anyway thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your help and support it's really good because we know that all these things are important as a surround in addition to the treatment and the diagnosis and all of those things so talk to your care teams and let them help you because they've got a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom so Thank you very much.